So I'd like to ask Martin Barnett to come up and talk about our daily bread. What went wrong? How do we reclaim the stuff of life? My name's Martin Barnett, and I'd like you to introduce you today some ideas about modern bread consumption and disease under the banner, Our Daily Bread, What Went Wrong, and How We Can Reclaim the Staff of Life. Since the 1960s, bread consumption in the Western world has plummeted 50%. During that time, wheat and grain and yeast allergies have increased exponentially. This talk will explore the correlation between industrial baking and the rise in of grain-based grain disease. We'll ask questions about today's artisan bread movement and suggest ways that we can support a move back to nutritional and well-crafted baked goods. About me. As a kid growing up in England in the 50s and 60s, I would sometimes eat four or five slices of bread with my supper. I enjoyed putting anything that was on my plate between two slices of bread to make a sandwich so you see, I came by my trade honestly. And if any of you know what a chip buddy is, I'm sure you will concur. Oops. When I arrived in Canada in 1977, I fell in love with the whole grain movement and a whole grain baker. And helped establish a work, worker self-managed bakery, which my family and I then ran independently from 1981. After selling my part of the business in 1997, I was fortunate enough to find a position in the pastry shop of the Fairmont Empress Hotel. And that was definitely a post-grad degree in pastryology and served me well in my dream to become a baking and pastry instructor. So I started to become a trades instructor and was hired by VIU, Vancouver Island University, which used to be called Malaspina University College in Nanaimo. I was hired in 2000 and it was and still is my dream job. I'm also a member of the Bread Bakers Guild of America and I'm on the Education Committee of the Baking Association of Canada. But I'm not a scientist, even though I'm wearing the white coat. I'm not a doctor, but I am, I hope, a purveyor of good nutrition and I teach and serve what I like to eat. But don't ask me complicated questions about microbiology. This is where I like to suggest that baking is an art. Although I stress to my students that it's really all chemistry and biology and physics. So on to the point about my talk. In recent times, we as a society have developed health issues that are connected to the consumption of grain products. We have celiac disease, which is the body's inability to digest grain products, i.e. gluten. Uh, gluten proteins. We have diabetes on the increase, both type 1 and 2. We have candida, which is the overdevelopment of harmful strains of yeast in our body, and a whole raft of wheat and grain sensitivities as well. These problems did not exist 50 years ago in the epidemic proportions that we, that we see now. So what has changed? I'm going to break it down into four components. Milling, commercial yeast, agriculture, and fermentation. All these are connected to labor costs and efficiency and the necessity to, feel, to feed an ever-increasing population. So milling, in the Industrial Revolution, high-speed mills were invented. These had steel rollers that generated heat and were very efficient. But the downside was that so much flour was produced in such a short time that the nutritious and tasty wheat, wheat germ had to be removed because it would cause the flour to go rancid before it could be used up. Also, the heat generated in high-speed milling destroys the nutrients naturally occurring in the grain. And even though the government has legislated to put some back artificially, they do not replace what has been lost. Are you familiar with a graham cracker? Do you know that the man that invented it, his name was Dr. Sylvester Graham. I'm not going to go into his history. He was a crackpot back then. Uh, he was a vegetarian. Uh, the bakers and the butchers used to uh, go to his talks and throw uh, rotten food at him. He, was, uh, um, he had lots of radical ideas, including total abstinence from sex. However, he got one thing right, and that was uh, he recognized that central milling, central industrial milling, destroyed not only the quality of flour, but also destroyed communities as well. So it's a 
very interesting. So check out Sylvester Graham. So around the same time, Louis Pasteur, another brilliant man, was working, he was working on his germ theory and also was able to observe how yeast work. He was a pretty special scientist and probably single-handedly is responsible for our population explosion. How ironic that his development of the commercial production of yeast is now one of the reasons we are getting sick. When commercial yeast was first introduced, it was very, very expensive, and those bakers that used, used it learned to use very tiny, small amounts and nurture the culture over many hours to exploit its fermentation properties. Unfortunately, as the price went down, the consumption went up and fermentation times were reduced. We now use in commercial baking hundreds of times more yeast than we need to use. Also in the 60s, one of the most inauspicious, terrible inventions in the commercial bread making process was, was called the Chorleywood Bread Process. It was developed in a place called the Chorleywood Bread Research Facility. <laughs> It sounds like something that MI5 came up with. It sounds really sinister. And it is sinister. They're able to take flour and water, yeast additives, and mix it high speed under a vacuum and in about two and a half minutes. We all know that traditionally bread is you know, a labor of love, of kneading for until you, until it's extensible and gluten's developed, but two and a half minutes they develop that. Not only that, but by, with the, under that pressure they were able to ferment and produce a finished loaf in three hours. It also exploited the poor quality of wheat available in the UK and it was the beginning of the end. So now, in the 1960s, instead of two eight-hour shifts to produce bread, even in the big bread factories, plants could now make all their bread in three hours. Although economically expeditious, the decline of bread in the Western world, North America, Canada, UK, Australia, and New Zealand, was now fully entrenched. Fast fermentation equals poor digestion, and I'll come back to that. So now we have industry influencing agriculture. The mechanized processes demanded special kinds of wheat. The, plant was, the wheat plant was hybrid to withstand the rigors of intensive mixing. These wheat stalks had a tendency to grow long and tall and they would fall over in the wind. So more modifications were uh, developed. And the resulting plant was much further away from the slowly developed original grain, one that we could digest as we had evolved with it over thousands of years as well. Next we have the lack of preparation of grains. You buy a multi-grain bread, but how have those grains been produced? Have they just taken a handful of grains and thrown it in the mix? Grains and seeds are not conducive to being digested by animals. The plant has only one goal in its short life. Does anybody know what that is? To produce another plant, yeah. So one of the ways to succeed is not allow the seed to be digested by animals. It protects itself with, and I hope I get this right, something called phytates. So if an animal eats grains, there is a possibility that, of that grain passing right through it unscathed. Fat chance then that the animal, or us, is able to use that, uh, the, uh, is able to use all the nutrition locked in the seed. So in order for us to make use of the minerals in, say, wheat bran, we have to neutralize the phytic acid. In unprocessed grains, 90% remain locked in. However, in properly processed grains, those that have undergone sprouting, soaking, roasting, or long fermentation, 90% of the minerals become available for absorption as the phytic acid is neutralized. And absorption in our bodies means better nutrition. Finally, I want to look at the magic of sourdough and the use of rye flour. Remember the story about uh, traditional bread baking in Egyptian times about 3,000 years ago? One day a piece of old dough or some beer foam fell, fell into a batch of gruel and, uh, and voila, or eureka, oh, no, that's Greek, isn't it? Uh, whatever the Egyptians would say, uh, the dough became light and fluffy overnight, tasted great, baked better, and everyone liked it. 
Modern techniques have destroyed this process in a few short decades. What does the sourdough process do? Well, it takes 24 hours for a start, which is lots of time to slowly develop the flavor, break down starches into fundamental sugars that can feed the yeast, work symbiotically with microbiological acids to develop lactic and acetic acids, which help to lower the glycemic index. Don't ask me about that stuff. It's compl complicated, but it's something to do with diabetes. Use of rye flour also enhances the fermentation process and makes bread that is more digestible, ferments faster, and produces more acid, all beneficial to our health. The bonus on top of the health benefits that acids produce help keep the bread for weeks without the use of chemical preservatives. And finally, bread made by the sourdough method tastes more interesting. Are you standing because I'm... Oh, darn. I'll go fast. Bulk fermentation is the resting of the dough in one big lump for, for many hours. During this time, natural enzymes, amylase, zymase, maltase, protease, and lipase, and others I cannot pronounce, all work together to slowly transform the starches into simple sugars and break down proteins and fat. In fact, digestion, before it goes into your body. And that's where the, develop, the flavor develops as well. So if we skimp this step, we're not only shooting ourselves, well, we're not shooting ourselves in the foot, we're shooting ourselves in the lower intestine and the taste buds. We just had a breakthrough in mainstream research. It was reported in the Journal of Clinical Gastroenterology and Hepatology. The Italian scientists have discovered, and I won't go into the whole uh, uh, experiment, that fully hydrolyzed baked goods do not cause any pain in celiacs. Fully hydrolyzed baked goods are, is the equivalent of a sourdough. Um, so I love it when, in the 21st century, science proves what our grandmothers knew all along. So finally, I just want to ask, to, to give you some questions to ask your, ask your bakers. Pick up a loaf of artisan bread. <coughs> ask them what makes it artisan. Is it adding sun-dried tomatoes and roasted garlic or some combination of trendy deli foods? No. It's not. Is it adding an instant powdered sourdough culture to a mix of white bread? Not in the slightest. That's what you're buying. Or is it, or that's what they're trying to sell you. Is it the product of a careful manipulation of time and temperature of basic ingredients, flour, water, salt, and leavening, to produce a well-balanced, tasty, nutritional loaf of bread? Ask if they use organic ingredients. And finally, what kind of whole wheat flour they use? In an anomaly of the federal Canadian consumer protection rules, 100% whole wheat flour used in 100% Canadian whole wheat bread is in fact treated white flour with bran added back in. A terrible lie. What we want to be eating is flour made from the whole grain. So, in closing, i just like to say, and I want you to say, no to shit factory bread. <laughs> <laughs>